Welcome to 805 Sports Talk, and we have one high school team standing, and Lorenzo, I'm happy you're still standing after that 14-inning yeah. marathon <laughs> on Tuesday that saw St. Joseph's softball team advance to the quarterfinals. So we'll start with that. That's kind of the big story. Um, we, we've kind of been highlighting the Knights throughout the season, and mm -hmm. here they are, the last team standing in the quarterfinals. You were at Santa Paula on Tuesday. Break down what you saw. My knees almost gave out that game <laughs> as well. <laughs> hey, you know what? It, it was, it truly was. An, an exciting game. I mean, I know the score didn't really indicate that, but it's one of those games where, I mean, you wonder who's going to have the big hit, if bases are loaded, who's going to score, and it seemed like it wasn't until the 14th inning when everything just unfolded, and there was also that crucial jam that Skyler had where the bases were loaded. In fact, John Welsh unintentionally actually allowed two Cardinal players to walk on base, walk on second, walk on first, with no outs. And, I mean, that's rolling the dice right there. That's almost like calling a blitz on a crucial play for football. But, you know, St. Joseph got out of that. So I think at that moment I was under the, the feeling that St. Joseph had this game, like, secured. It was just a matter of just who was going to come through with that big hit. And a name we don't always really mention, Zeta Altide. She had the crucial hit that brought the two runners home and helped lift St. Joseph's spirits up. But, I mean, one of the things that John Welsh told me right after the game is that this team, for this team to go through 14 innings without allowing a single run, it shows you the character and the resiliency of this group. Definitely, that's like two games worth there with, with 14 innings. And I know we talked about Skylar Johnson a lot, and she deserves a lot of credit going 14 innings. Yeah. Shut out um, Mia Barrasso from Santa Paulo, who's matched her pretty much pitch for pitch, it seems like. But St. Joseph's also showed that they are teams. Zeta Alfilde mm -hmm. with a big hit. Rihanna Munoz has been huge. I think Zeta also had a big hit against Slow when they clinched that playoff spot a few weeks ago. So I, I think it is definitely a team effort. You see the coaching from John Welch uh, also, you know, deciding to load the bases there with back-to-back -back mm -hmm. intentional walks, and that panned out for them. So it's a little bit of everybody pitching in there. They also went with a courtesy runner that, that you know, that seemed to, to pan out well with, with the second run coming across. So it seems like a lot of the moves John Welch has made worked out. Skyler Johnson's been clutch, you know. It sounded like he also kind of yeah. thought about, you know, replacing her, but, mm -hmm. but stuck with her, and that, and that seemed to pan out. So and all the coaching decisions and, and every little play by all these, you know, kind of role players seemed to work out for the Knights. And I think that right there, that goes to show you how much of a player's coach John Welsh really is. I mean, he would have he gone with Brianna, but Skylar flat out told him, no, I got this. I mean, we, these guys haven't scored yet. I got this. And he ended up trusting Skylar, and it worked out beautifully. Another player we should add as well, Ali Diaz. She's had some pretty crucial hits. She had at least two hits in this game. She's one of the few seniors on this team. And keep in mind, she was on those St. Joseph teams that couldn't even get in the win column in the Pac-8. Now they're making the CIF run. Yeah, I think Allie was one of those players who really started that, that culture change that you talked about last week. When, when they were struggling a couple years ago, the Ali Diaz was always that name that we were hearing, you know, better watch out for her. When that program turns around, she's going to be right there. And, and she's been in the forefront of it, you know, pretty much catching every pitch from, from Johnson being that kind of spark plug player there so Ali Diaz has been huge and, and a lot of those role players that St. Joseph has has been huge Sienna Cavazos, Holly Hunter so Skylar Johnson gets a lot of attention but it does seem like there, there's a whole bunch of players that can contribute to this team and I don't think any of any of us would have picked that St. Joseph would be the last spring team standing for I us. I would not have. <laughs> um, Holly Hunter has been real consistent all year. Um, Ali Diaz as well mm -hmm. and Brianna Munoz. Um, 14 innings, 1-0, not only does the pitching have to be good in that situation, the defense has to be mm -hmm. strong behind her. They've they've played, what, 28 innings of postseason ball so far, and one run has been scored against them. And it's so like pitching three, yeah. de and defense, <laughs> you can't get much better. And it that. literally so. took three hours for somebody to score. <laughs> that goes to show you the magnitude of that game, but you know what? I'll, I know we don't cover Santa Paula a lot, but I'll give credit to Mia Barrazzo. She was as good as advertised, and she's only a sophomore. So I got a feeling Skyler and Mia are going to be two household names. And yeah. The also, one, nah, I guess John Welch is going to, we'll have to watch to see how S Skyler recovers to start her, what, less than 36 hours after she went 14 innings. That's 
it'd be taller, but I'm sure he'll be on top of it to see how she seems to be recovering, how her arm feels. Yeah, they so they did forth. give the team a – John actually said that there was no practice today, <laughs> so maybe that might help. Yeah, after a 14-inning game, I can, I right. can understand that move, <laughs> definitely. Well, you know, Skyler's going to want to be on the mound. Oh, she'll yeah, want to be on the mound, uh, yeah, but she, he's going to and, mo and monitor it. Uh, she's only a freshman. Soft, sophomore. Sophomore, okay. So she's got a couple years left, too, so – uh, he's not John Welch is not losing a lot when this season is over. He doesn't have a lot of kids graduating. Yeah, I think Munoz is a freshman, so I, I think at least two more years at Johnson and Munoz together, and, and I think Diaz is a senior. So there are quite a few seniors on that team, but they are they are pretty young, and and they will have a home quarterfinal game on Thursday at well, at St. Louis de Montfort, so that should be fun. I, I think, think there's going to be a good atmosphere there on Thursday. I think one player who should be mentioned also is, is Paige Hugenard. She's mm -hmm. a, she's also oh, yeah. been a consistent hitter for there. She's she's about their leading hitter, I believe. I think she's yeah. hitting about 350. Yeah, she's been And Skyler, I think, is either second or third as far as hitting on the team. I'll add one more thing. I mean, I know John Welsh has had some very successful Aurora Grande teams, but just talking to him, I feel like that he's just even more like eu euphoric about coaching at St. Joseph because he did tell me that he had daughters who attended St. Joseph and he also lives across the street from St. Louis de Mumford so I mean he is an orchid guy from and through so there's just that feeling of mm -hmm. he's a new man because of where he's at. He coached orchid youth all-star softball for mm -hmm. years well, so he really had his coaching roots. And he, he has a granddaughter who's on the St. Joseph JV team mm -hmm. so he'll have his own granddaughter on the squad fairly soon too. Uh, so that gives him a little bit more incentive to stay on retired for a few more seasons. Yeah, so we had a kind of a surprising run last year with Santa Maria Baseball making it to the championship game and winning it. We'll see if St. Joseph can kind of carry that and, and make mm -hmm. a championship game this year. But they are in the quarterfinals at home on Thursday at St. Louis and Montfort. So go check out a good softball game. The last team standing on the Central Coast, at least in our direct coverage area. I know Templeton's is alive as well. Atascadero softball alive as well. We did see slow baseball get knocked out um, on Tuesday. That was a bit of a surprise. And we also saw St. Joseph baseball team lose um, at home against Summit. Kenny, you were on hand for that one. Zach Trevino got the start for the Knights. And uh, you know he wasn't off by much, but he was just off enough to kind of open the door for Summit, um, were you surprised with, with Trevino, who's been so solid all year? I think he was 7-1 and one on the season. Um, kind of shaky a little bit, um, and, and the Summit got away with the 7-1 and one victory. Were you surprised at, at how that played out? I was I was surprised that he didn't have better command of the strike mm -hmm. zone, but, but that happens sometimes. Uh, sometimes a usually reliable control picture is off, and his pitches just weren't missing by much, but What's really struck me, though, more than Trevino missing the strike zone, albeit rather narrowly, was the discipline that Summit's hitters showed. They did not, mm -hmm. they did not bite at those slow balls that did not miss by much. And if they had, they likely would have swung and missed or beat the ball into a gr the ground for a ground ball out. Uh, se I mean, seven walks against Trevino, I think that was about the main thing, and they got a couple of clutch hits around those walks. I thought it was... It was sort of an odd game. Summit had four hits, didn't get any after the third inning. Um, St. Joseph out hit them 6-4, but that wound up not meaning anything. James Delgado was around the plate all day. He threw the six innings, only walked one, and their reliever came in from first base and shut the door. But what struck me, I would say, the most was just the plate discipline. That was some of the best plate discipline by high school hitters, really, mm -hmm. that I've seen in my 17 years here. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I think St. Joseph's got to feel a little um, let down, because from what I saw from that game, it did seem like they, they could compete right. with Summit. Just a, I thought a, they could. a few I things here and there. Like, <clears throat> like you said, they did out-hit Summit 6-4. Uh, when you just give up four hits, but uh, but uh, issue some walks, you got to feel that you kind of kind of gave it away a little bit instead of uh, you know forcing Summit to earn the win there. Uh, it is a second round appearance for the Knights. They they do end the season I think with the 18 wins, so it's a good season. But you still got to feel you know a little let down with with the way that one played out, not forcing Summit to to take a win, kind of kind of giving it away there a little bit. So I, I think a a little disappointment there, but still a really good season for Cody Smith. 13 seniors I think he has, so. It's going to take a little bit rebuilding next year with, with all that they lose, but I wouldn't be surprised to see them 
you know, kind of turn it around quickly and, and end up in the playoffs again next year, especially being in the central section. And Cody Smith is pretty familiar with that central section, playing at Fresno State. He has some ties there. So, um, you know, if they make the postseason, he's probably going to be a little familiar with some of the teams that they're playing this year, uh, next year. So I think it's going to be fun to see Cody Smith and that program transition into the central section. I think he's ready for it. And I, I think a lot of these programs are going to be kind of excited to, to move into the central section. I'm kind of excited for it to see some of the matchups, some of the playoff yeah. matchups, and see how these teams do fare against those central sections. I'm jacked up, too, because I, I have a familiarity with some of those schools out north. I mean, especially Clovis with Buchanan. Uh, Clovis High has had a legend there in Coach Pat, James Patrick, who has been there for like almost 40 years. And then you also have some of the Bakersfield schools and the Tulare schools also, as well. Yeah, and we're just a, a few months away from that central section transition. It's right around the corner, and we'll have football season starting a little bit earlier this year, um, about mid-August. So, yeah, we're getting real close to, you know, having covering sec central section teams. Of course, we'll also have uh, Lompoc, San Inez, and Cabrillo staying in that southern section. So we're getting closer. Uh, San Inez softball team is going to be in the southern section next year. They're remaining there, and, and they had a good run this year, making um, the second round just coming up just a bit short from from making the quarterfinals um i didn't really expect them to to be able to compete in division five this year they were in division seven i think a lot of people thought that the pirates had a, a deep run last year to this final because they were in division seven what the lowest division that they had last year so i think a lot of people didn't expect them to be able to compete in division five but they lost five four at riverside north on tuesday in a second round game so they were right there uh, Kenny, I think you took the call from Denisha Gills. What they score? San Diego scored the first three runs, or right. three runs in the first they inning. Denisha it. Gills felt like they had it. She said they had it. A couple miscues on defense, and they come up a bit short. But they were, you know, lose one run on the road, three straight road playoff games, I believe, for them. Didn't get lucky on any of the coin tosses, so they had right. to travel for every game. A lot of travel, and they were just so close to making a quarterfinal run after being bumped up two divisions. So I don't think we can say enough about what San Inez did this year. Um, moving up two divisions and nearly making the quarterfinals. I think they, a couple plays, sounds like a couple plays went their way there in the quarterfinals this year, and, and hopefully they would have got a home <laughs> game in the quarterfinals. But, yeah, a great run for them this year, and I think they did that without Maggie Usher, who's yeah. missed a the good whole. deal. They had her back yesterday, but okay. she had missed quite a bit before that. She's injury. missed a good deal of the season. She's been nursing a minor back injury, and they've been treating her with kid gloves, so... Uh, yeah, she was back yesterday for the first time. She missed the first two playoff games, but she was a little bit rusty. And she's back again one more year, I think. So mm -hmm. they got their battery of Armani Garcia and her. Uh, Maggie Usher will be back. So they, they're bringing back a whole lot of kids uh, that had that great run when they were all freshmen and sophomore last year, and now they moved up a year. I just think they're going to get better. I, they, but they had a good year. I think so too. I mean, last year was impressive enough. I mean, going from oh, well, literally 0 and 38 though the f before that run, and then getting bumped two divisions to Division Five and nearly uh, nearly winning that game down in Riverside. So I think this year was just as equally impressive. Yeah, we can see how quickly things do turn around for for programs when you get maybe a little coaching change and a pitcher comes in. See it with St. Joseph softball this year. Armani Garcia and Denisha Gills has done it kind of over there at San Inez. So we're seeing a qu really quick turnarounds with some of these programs, and San Inez is is right there. I think they'll, you know, I think they should make the quarterfinals next year if they have Armani Garcia. She she was pretty solid against North. I think she had eight Ks, another complete game. Uh, she pitched just about every inning for San Inez this year, and she'll be a junior next year. So she's got at least two more years of eligibility there. So I wouldn't. I don't think San Inez is going to go away. I think their league is going to be a little bit tougher next year. I, th I think that league is a little tougher than what the LPL's had. The LPL's been pretty tough, though, with, with we've seen Templeton still alive in the playoffs. Lompoc's usually pretty good, and they're, they're going to remain in the same league. So I think it might be a little bit tougher this year. Um, looking at the baseball and softball seasons as a whole, Kenny, how would you kind of sum up what we saw this year? A little down, about an average season, uh, above expectations. How would you kind of sum up what we've seen this year with one team standing? Uh, to be honest, um, to be honest, if I was a down year, I've been here since 2000. These are the, it's the first time I remember there that I can remember that there was um, no North County, North Northern Santa Barbara County League Championship in any of the four 
either Pac-8 mm -hmm. or LPL baseball and softball. Um, it's it's also the first time I can remember that um, no baseball team from here has made the quarterfinals. So I think, to be honest, it was a it was a very lean year. Yeah, all of a sudden, Luis Obispo County team seemed to have better years. This was years their banner year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we've <laughs> talked about the schools that had decent years for the most part, uh, but uh, yeah, it was a surprisingly weak showing for the North County schools in the LPL and Pac-8, and well, I've been here just about as long as Kenny. And you, you've been on here just leagues, as long as far as the, baseball and softball yeah, seasons. Yeah, we've covered as many seasons, and you know, we had the Northern League, and you know, the, the names may have changed, but and Templeton used to be in a different section, and uh, uh, Mission Prep used to be in a different section. So things mm -hmm. have changed over the years. But one thing that's been pretty consistent is one or two of the teams from down here have shown up. Uh, Lompo Cabrillo baseball, softball, Rigetti baseball. Uh, but uh, it hasn't wasn't a good year for didn't pan most out of that way guys. this year. Yeah, it was surprising. Yeah. Yeah. St. Joseph softball was the has been the only salvaging. And St. Joseph really baseball has uh, had a had a, a, had a better year, year than we expected. And, and they weren't even league worse. champions. No, they weren't even the league no, champions. No, but either. four seed. Yeah. This is really this is the as I said, like I have covered I think seventeen. Like Elliot, I've covered we've covered seventeen baseball and softball postseasons here. I'm not sure this is true, but this is the first year that I can remember that no baseball team from the North County has made it to the quarterfinals. Yeah, we hope that's just a cycle and, and mm -hmm. not a trend. Of, of yeah, yeah, yeah. there are up and down cycles every year. There, there's years yeah, in so. which, I mean, it may look down, but then the next year you might see an upswing. I mean, we'll see. All right, and I think there was a little bit of disappointment this weekend at the CIF track finals. Kenny, you were down in Torrance at El Camino College for that CIF Southern Section finals for track and field. Um, we, I think we have one Masters qualifier in our coverage area, and that's from San Ynez, Sarah Perkins. She won the shot put, uh, not a great showing in the discus, but she's advanced to the Masters. Uh, Joseph Dominguez didn't have his best weekend. How would you sum up what you saw down in Torrance? Um, really, when he looked at the there with the marks, I think Sarah probably figured to be the only Masters qualifier mm -hmm. from here. But it figured that she would also have a better chance in the. I mean, she had an off day in the discus um, shot put. Her she has struggled with her shot put the last couple weeks. Um, she won it on her last throw, 40 feet 10 inches, which is a fairly pedestrian throw for her. But mm -hmm. still, you have to say would have to say. It's a good day for her overall. She 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 thought she would have a chance to ma qualify for the Masters. She wasn't sure she'd have a chance to qualify as good as fifth overall, and that's what she did. And of course, if she duplicates that fifth place finish at the Masters meet, she'll qualify for the state meet, top six advance automatically. Um, uh, Joseph gave it his all. I thought he might. I thought I thought he made his move a little too soon. He didn't have as much left at the mm -hmm. end as he did at the prelims. Of course, he had an easier race at the prelims. I mean, at the finals, it's all quality. At the prelims, you're just trying to qualify mainly. But um, Colin Kirkpatrick, um, but he measured Joseph's kick pretty well, and um, by the time they hit the middle of the last turn you could tell that Colin was in striking range um, Joseph tried but he he just couldn't keep his stride up and um, he simply didn't have as much left as Kirkpatrick did down the stretch so not a not a really bad race I thought he possibly mm -hmm. could have run a little better race he ran a Joseph ran a 417.90 that's a competitive time for him he's run 415 plus earlier he may have peaked a little early he went to several several big meets this year he was at Arcadia mm -hmm. and there's a west another west coast relays I believe and there was a meet of champions so he went to several big meets this year now I I just wonder how many big meets one can go to without mm -hmm. and still keep your sharpest edge for the for the finals but overall, he, he had a very good season. Um, mm -hmm. And even by his best mark, it would have been tough 
for Joseph to qualify for Masters even with a 415 plus. That, that's a pretty salty group in the Division One and Two when it comes to 1600 meter runners. I'm shocked that there's only one area person moving on the Masters. I mean, you would normally see like three or four, but would you say track and field was kind of this little down? Yeah, sure down yes. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we usually do have some some kids moving on to the Masters, as, as several of them, mm -hmm. and you know we we we've usually had have at least three or so. Yeah, we had mm -hmm. some strong hurdlers at advance. You know, Haley Batty was in the state tournament, state meet last year. So yeah, I, I think we, I wouldn't be surprised if Sarah Perkins does advance. It seems like she's, reading your, your quotes from her over the last couple of weeks, seems like she's always right there from, from getting that throw that she's looking for. So if she can put it all together, I wouldn't be surprised to see her advance. Like you said, she was a fifth qualifier for the Masters and that would probably, be, I guess, be good enough With to get With kind of an stage. average throw for her. Yeah. So. I'll go out on a limb and say, I think next year you'll see more qualifiers from this area in the Masters meet because you have Ty Hernandez at Cabrillo coming back. Jackson Anderson comes back over at Cabrillo. You have Asia Simmons coming back at Lompoc. You have the Booker sisters. They have Daddy. some good talent yeah. coming back. Mm -hmm. As you said, Lompoc Valley has some very good younger talent coming back. And there are the Booker twins, the entire Rigetti girls 4x1 relay. They didn't have their best day at the finals, but um, but th that, inquire, that entire group is back. So they're, ex they're excited about that. We'll have to worry about the Central Section Finals next year and the CIF Southern Section Finals next year with, with how our school there, are kind of There's split already up this record that may not be touched. Casimir Allen at Two-Layer Union, oh. I read, ran a 10-3, 100-meter dash. I don't think that will be touched. 10-3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. uh, for our future UCLA football possible uh, star there. So, yeah, from Tulare Tula Tula Union. Tula yeah. Union yeah, and so. state record holder in touchdowns <laughs> in the single <laughs> season. All right. Um, we got another rodeo update. We had some, I guess, our first, maybe our first winner's crown over the weekend. Uh, we had the Miss Rodeo Queens was it over the weekend. Not um, Queens. Miss Rodeo. Miss Rodeo. Mm -hmm. Miss Mini Rodeo. Miss Rodeo over the weekend. Can you kind of update us on that and then make sure we got everything we need to know down pat for the, the, the rodeo, which is about a week away. Okay, so they've started this new uh, competition for the Miss Rodeos, the Miss Mini Rodeo and the Miss Rodeo 2018. Now, separate from the Queen c Contest, the Queens are still there. They've been going for six weeks, raising money that is brought back to the community to mostly youth programs, uh, and that hasn't changed. Uh, but the Miss Rodeos uh, are different. Uh, the the Santa, Miss Santa Maria Elks Rodeo 2018, the first one ever, is Ashley Singh. She's a 19-year-old graduate of St. Joseph High School. She graduated last year and is already a sophomore at Hancock College. And she was a queen in uh, 2016. So she's been both now the, a queen and the very first ever Miss Rodeo. And Miss Rodeo uh, will had to d demonstrate all kinds of things, uh, sort of like a beauty pageant with horsemanship in included. They had to do an interview process because uh, these these people are going to have to do an awful lot of media. Uh, both the Miss Mini Rodeo, which is Hannah Palin, she's a 11 year old fifth grader at the Alice Shaw School, and Ashley Singh. Uh, they'll they get sashes. And uh, uh, Ashley Singh is, uh, will be in the arena. She's also a flag girl, which is like, I think her sixth year as a flag girl. So she's going to be just in the arena all the time, riding the sponsor flags or at, at representing the, the rodeo as Miss Rodeo. But then she will go to other rodeos as a representative of the Santa Maria Elks Rodeo. Uh, she will take part in the state championship, a state competition, and if she wins, Miss California Rodeo, uh, then she'll be eligible for the national competition, and we could see her at the National Finals Rodeo in December riding a horse and representing Santa Maria and the Santa Maria Elks. So that's different. The Queens are a local contest, and they don't go on to other competitions. The Miss Mini Rodeo, Hannah Palin, is uh, the first of those, and she will have the same responsibilities in the mini rodeo, but they'll bring her along for the big rodeo as well. They'll want everybody to get to know her as the first of the Miss Mini Rodeos. And uh, they are having a junior barrelman contest. They postponed that, so we don't know who that is just yet, but I talked to uh, now six-time champion uh, rodeo clown Justin Rumford, 
uh, and six straight years he's been the uh, champion. So, I mean, he's the defending champion right now as rodeo clowns go. And he's coming back for his third trip to the Santa Maria Elks Rodeo. And he, the, the, the Elks had a, a special mini barrel man barrel made, you know, a, a junior barrel man barrel. It is a kid size barrel. So it's not the uh, hundred pounds that our Jason Anderson fell over in last uh, or two years ago. Uh, it's a smaller one, but it'll look identical to it. And it was actually made by Justin Rumford's barrel maker in Weatherford, Texas. So we know that it's going to be identical, except in size. It'll have that quality. Uh, so they'll have a junior barrel man working with Justin Rumford in all the mutton busting. And then, of course, uh, starting next uh, next Tuesday, it goes kind of crazy for what's five six days uh, clown school or clown college sixth annual clown college uh, is going to be Tuesday night and the new uh, Miss Rodeo Miss Mini Rodeo and uh, the Queen candidates and the junior barrel man they'll all be there media will be there as we all learn how to be uh, clowns and then we'll <laughs> uh, also assist uh, Justin Rumford during the uh, mutton busting in each of the performances and then Wednesday there everybody is in town there's a meet and greet uh, Jason Anderson and I are going to that so that we can do some interviews because Thursday it gets underway for real there's the mini rodeo in the morning 6,000 more than 6,000 st uh, students coming in from all the area elementary schools and it'll all kids uh, from four years old up to 17 competing so it's kids competing in front of kids uh, and it's spectacular and that was like one of Clarence Manetti's dreams he, he was a longtime Elks Rodeo chairman I talked to uh, two of his three children yesterday uh, Susie Manetti Reggetti and his son Tyke uh, and uh, they're all thrilled that they brought back the mini rodeo a few years ago and now it's taken another step with a junior barrel man with a Miss Mini Rodeo uh, and then uh, after that, Thursday evening at 6, we'll have a live broadcast from the uh, Rodeo Arena. Uh, Jason Anderson will be our technical director, as he is today over there. And uh, he and I will be out there. We'll have uh, some live interviews, some pre-taped interviews, but we'll have a little bit of everything as we get ready for the 7 o'clock kickoff. Thursday and Friday night, 7 o'clock performances, Saturday at 6. Uh, Sunday at 2, and then there's all kinds of things. There's a, uh, a Monte Carlo night where um, mm -hmm. uh, money will be raised for uh, ca cancer funds, and there'll be a, a celebrity uh, barrel race. Uh, we have an entry in that, and actually we're the sponsor of the C Monte Carlo night as well. There'll be barn dances and fundraisers and the parade Saturday morning. It's, it's just non-stop rodeo activity for the next week and uh, so I'm taking a deep breath uh, and uh, getting ready to get my uh, rodeo boots on mm -hmm. and uh, we'll get out there and get the coverage going. And the hat as well and <laughs> everything else. Yeah. As you can tell it's mm -hmm. Elliot's favorite time of the year so uh, yep. we're, we're almost done talking about the rodeo and we actually get some rodeo action next week. Yes. It'll be at Clown School on Tuesday. I think Matthew Bursiaga our, our Education Reporter is also going to be a clown school, and then you did mention the, the special edition of it, live edition of 805 Sports Talk next Thursday yeah. at 6 p.m. So you, you're doing a great job bringing us, bringing our viewers, our readers, so much radio coverage. So I'm, I'm sure you're excited, and hopefully our viewers and our readers are excited. So once again, you will get, guys will see a live edition of 805 Sports Talk at the rodeo Thursday at 6 p.m. That's all we got for this week.